Hello, everyone. I'm Rula Khalaf, editor of the Financial Times. It's good to be here, and many thanks for all of you who are joining us. Um, we have a great lineup for you this morning to discuss the government's response to the pandemic. The fiscal and monetary support that we've seen has been extraordinary. It's like the magic money tree. So we're going to look at the impact of the massive stimulus, stimulus, the lessons that have been learned, and the current health of the financial system. Now, I'm delighted to be joined by Anna Boutin, Group Executive Chairman at Santander, and Mohamed Al Jadan, Minister of Finance of Saudi Arabia. Um, Yi Gang, Governor of the Central Bank of China, and Thomas uh, Berl, CEO of AXA. A warm welcome to all of you. Um, just a word on the format of uh, this session. I'm going to be moderating a discussion uh, between the panelists for about 30 minutes, and then I will take questions from the audience. So. Uh, um, I can see the questions in the Zoom chat, so please keep them coming throughout the session. Uh, Governor, yes. if I may start uh, with you, it's, uh, it's good to have you. Um, it's been a year since the outbreak of uh, the pandemic, which started in, in Wuhan. Uh, China's economy is uh, recovering. Growth was up 6.5% in the fourth quarter. What are you projecting for this year? Um, and the growth is, is still uh, driven um, by the same playbook. Uh, consumption is down, industrial production is up, uh, still a, a big trade surplus. So can one speak of a more sustainable consumption led shift? Uh, yes, uh, that's a very good question. I, I think uh, uh, Chinese economy is already getting uh, more and more uh, consumption driven. Uh, mm -hmm. That is a healthy uh, structural change. I think uh, this is a sustainable uh, trend which will uh, continue. As you said that uh, you see we are in a pandemic crisis. Uh, this January, uh, like uh, January last year, uh, COVID-19 become uh, uh, more severe in the world due to uh, cold weather. Uh, the uncertainty of uh, COVID-19 uh, is on the rise. Uh, in China, you, you mentioned that uh, we have been controlling uh, the uh, COVID-19 fairly well, uh, thanks to the rigorous measures such as uh, wearing masks, uh, wash hands, tracing, testing, and uh, social distancing, so that uh, we continue uh, and consistent doing the above measures, so we can, uh, in general, uh, under control uh, in China uh, so far uh, from the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, we, we have a worst beginning, but uh, after a few months in Wuhan, and basically, uh, uh, since uh, last March, uh, the country's uh, uh, large-scale uh, COVID-19 uh, has been, uh, by and large, controlled. So that uh, we still uh, uh, continue our uh, measure, and we have also started the uh, uh, vaccine uh, process uh, as scheduled, beginning with uh, uh, healthy workers and some other high-risk group. And we will continue to take uh, any active part in international cooperation. China will work for greater uh, accessibility and affordability of vaccines in developing uh, countries. Uh, second, I want to say uh, a little bit uh, about uh, China's uh, economic and uh, financial development uh, under the uh, uh, COVID-19. Last year, uh, China GDP, uh, as you mentioned, the, the, the last quarter uh, of last year uh, grew at about 6.5%. Uh, For the whole year last year, China GDP grew by 2.3%. Uh, uh, consumer price index is 2.5%, uh, and uh, the unemployment rate uh, last year 
is about 5.6 percent, which is lower than 6 percent the expectation. As of the end of last year, renminbi appreciate against the U.S. dollar about 7 percent. People's Bank of China injected more than 9 trillion renminbi, which is equivalent to 1.5 trillion U.S. dollar liquidity into the market uh, last year. And uh, they also launched two targeted uh, facilities to support uh, micro and small businesses. At the end of uh, December, uh, broad money M2 uh, grew about 10.1 percent, and the total social finance grew about 13 percent. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's basically the market condition is uh, pretty uh, sound. The uh, monetary policy uh, will continue to uh, prompting up the economy, but at the same time, we also watch for the uh, risks. Uh, one risk is uh, uh, the macro leverage ratio of China increased somewhat last year. The second uh, risk is uh, non-performance. Long start to uh, growing, and also we also uh, uh, look at the uh, uh, external risk, uh, which is uh, uh, look at the uh, uh, capital flow uh, situation. Looking forward, I think uh, our monetary policy will continue, and uh, we will keep a dedicated balance between supporting economic recovery at the same time preventing uh, risk. Uh, we will uh, ensure that the policy are consistent and uh, stable and will not exit from supporting policy prematurely. Uh, you ask uh, the prediction for this year. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, that uh, will largely depend on the assumption on the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, trend. Mm -hmm. My large probability prediction that uh, uh, this year Chinese uh, GDP will grow uh, more or less uh, along the potential uh, growth uh, level uh, that is uh, more or less resuming uh, to the uh, normal trend. And the third and lastly, I want to mention uh, uh, green finance. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis uh, once again highlights the importance of uh, harmony between man and the nature. It also uh, reminds us uh, the imminent risk of climate change. Uh, yesterday, President Xi uh, reiterated uh, that uh, China, uh, they are going to uh, achieve uh, peak carbon emission before 2030 and uh, carbon neutrality before 2060. The yeah. People's Bank of China, which is the central bank of China, stand ready to support this climate uh, commitment through better resources allocation and the risk management and the market-based uh, pricing by putting in place a green financial system. The system will include five pillars, namely first, the system of green financial standard, second, supervision and the disclosure requirements for green financial institutions. Third, incentive and credit support for emission reduction. Fourth, the market of green finance uh, products, such as uh, green loan, green bonds, and uh, carbon futures. Fifth, the international cooperation on green finance. Thank you very much. Let me uh, let me just follow uh, follow up with um, uh, one question. I, I started by asking you uh, about uh, consumption-led growth. Um, the, the, in the fourth quarter, there was no sign of any shift to consumption-led growth. Uh, I, I think uh, the uh, impact of uh, COVID nineteen they are directly on the consumption, especially service consumption, like uh, restaurant party and airline and uh, train traveling uh, theaters and so on and so forth. So that uh, in Chinese economy and uh, consumption uh, account for about 60% uh, 
of the growth. Uh, but uh, during the pandemic, the percentage of consumption decreased. And as I think uh, as we uh, control the uh, pandemic, uh, consumption will resume to the uh, more or less uh, normal level. And uh, the other trend is uh, uh, right now in China, our saving rate uh, is uh, starting to decline a little bit every year. So that, that is a good indication that uh, more uh, growth comes from uh, consumption. Uh, our export uh, uh, this year will continue to uh, be uh, pretty good, but I think uh, the economic policy the monetary policy, macroeconomic policy, the physical policy, all focusing on maximize employment. If we have stable employment, that will guarantee uh, very good consumption. So that by and large, our macroeconomic policy and the monetary policy would focus on uh, consumption and make uh, China to a smooth transition to a consumption-driven economy. Domestic demand would be by and large the most important and the bulk of the entire uh, economy. Thank you. Okay. I'll, I'll come back to you a bit later, uh, Governor, uh, when we when we discuss uh, fintech. Um, Anna, but I want to turn to you. The picture, of course, has been uh, very different outside China um, and outside Asia. Um, how do you see the medium-term impact of the pandemic in Europe and, and the Americas? Um, and then we'll move on to the financial sector specifically. Sure. Hello, Rula. It's great to be with you and everybody. Um, so uh, in Europe, clearly, we have suffered uh, a lot. Uh, in 2020, we're looking at a GDP that's probably going to fall around 5%. And, um, and in this regard, southern countries like Spain, Italy, and a few others are going to suffer more. Uh, and my view is that for 2021, actually, this is my... Uh, very strong belief that vaccination is the most effective 2021 economic policy. So obviously this means uncertainty, uh, but I do want to make a very important point and it has happened in the past. And that is when there is a crisis, Europe makes progress and there has been significant institutional progress in Europe during a crisis. And this is very important for the medium term. Just briefly, everybody knows the Reconstruction Fund. It's a historic initiative. We've never seen the European Union putting together a $750 billion uh, program. And of course, the ECB intervening early and decisively to make sure that national risk spreads uh, don't go the way they went in the last crisis. So again, it's a critical step that Europe has taken towards federalization. For the first time, we have issued our own debt the, as a European Union and created taxes to service these liabilities. My last point is that the challenge for Europe now is how efficiently we use these funds and the, govern and the governance. Um, and of course, there's a conditionality, which means reforms, which again are meant to speed up the digitalization and the energy transition. And Europe is going to do this together. And it's the only way to have a sustainable growth strategy. So great crisis, but also a great new opportunity. Um, I, I like the vaccination as the best economic policy this year. Good line. For 21, yes. Um, um, uh, it's until, uh, unlike tw uh, 2008, the financial sector has not been at the heart of, uh, of this crisis. In fact, it's been, it's been quite resilient while the shock has been in the real um, money more pronounced in the real economy. Um, but I find uh, bankers that I talk to quite sanguine about what could come next when the stimulus ends and bankruptcies uh, begin. Are, do, do you think banks are underplaying the risks ahead? Well, Rula, look, you know, there is uncertainty, uh, but I like to define myself and I define myself today as an optimist that worries a lot. So we do have to take great care. But the fact is the banking sector is liquid, well capitalized, highly regulated and intens intensively supervised. And this is something that was a consequence of 2008. And we have not been part of the problem, but part of the solution. I mean, Santander has been lending 1 billion euros a day since the start of the pandemic. We've grown our loans. So, um, so yes, I do think, of course, we have to be prudent. Yes, there's a lot of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. 
I like to call this radical uncertainty. Um, and, uh, but there's a lot of good work that has happened and we actually, you know, we do need at some point, I wrote about this in, in the FT a few weeks ago, we do need to think ahead how it is that the financial system can continue supporting the economy and can use the buffers that we have built in an effective way. So, you know, we need to be safe for depositors. We also need to support the economy, especially in Europe where banks are the majority of lending to SMEs, which are the hardest hit companies in this crisis, the most vulnerable, both companies and workers. Very true. Um, Thomas Buber, I, um, I wanted to bring you in uh, here to talk about another risk, the impact, the impact of low interest rates. Much to celebrate there, but there are, they are also creating asset bubbles. Uh, we're running, uh, we just started a series yesterday about uh, runaway markets. How worried are you and where specifically do you see bubbles? So it is true that, uh, thank you, Rula, and good morning to everybody, that low interest rates is certainly uh, a concern. They were low before the crisis. They are even lower now. And uh, the question is also, how long uh, will they stay low? And this is obviously uh, a concern, um, certainly uh, for the question around uh, what is the uh, behavior uh, of uh, economic actors when it comes to uh, borrowing debt. But it also is the question, um, how do we make sure that um, we have sufficient savings and sufficient uh, yield on the savings um, in order to pay for our retirements? Um, uh, for me personally, I do believe that um, the period of uh, uh, low interest rates uh, is necessary now in order to uh, make sure that financial markets uh, are continuing to work, that um, we can also, uh, that states can also ensure uh, that the uh, necessary uh, debt is being taken in order to um, uh, cross uh, this very difficult phase of the crisis. So it is absolutely necessary uh, to have that. However, um, when I look forward, uh, there are certainly clouds uh, on the horizon. And uh, one issue is clearly for me, how can we make sure that uh, we exit uh, this uh, period of low interest rates um, in a way that it is, uh, on the one hand, uh, finding a good balance uh, and not um, choking uh, that will be a very fine line how do we get uh, back uh, to normality and this is also then obviously linked as well to a second question what is the reaction uh, of the markets it is clear that some markets um, have very very high uh, valuations today uh, in particular when you look at stocks and so the question is uh, when it comes back to normal what does it mean to these valuations and how uh, do we also see companies behaving when it comes to um, uh, the exit uh, from uh, this uh, negative interest rate uh, period and low interest rate period because um, some companies uh, have clearly been able to borrow that wouldn't have uh, normally been able to borrow. And so this question around um, how do you exit uh, the low interest rates uh, period, how do you make sure that this is synchronized across uh, the different uh, geographies and how do you make sure that this is a soft landing uh, in also avoiding uh, inflation coming back is certainly uh, one of the major issues uh, that uh, the financial system needs to focus on post-crisis. Indeed, it's quite, it's quite a dilemma for policymakers because um, on the one hand, they need to avoid choking the, the recovery, but on the other hand, they don't want to encourage uh, more more risk taking, um, and it, it it feels right now as if markets are assuming a very strong rebound in the second half of the year. As we see, though, um, and and particularly in Europe, um, the the, vac the vaccine and what you know what Anna referred to as the as the uh, uh, most important. Um, uh, economic policy is, is quite patchy. There's a lot more uncertainty. Do you think that this is, I mean, do you agree with me that this is what the markets are assuming? And what, what should they really be looking at? Yes, so I think when you, it was also good, um, uh, Anna, in saying that uh, the financial markets have been stable, 
the central banks have really managed um, this first phase of the crisis uh, extremely well. And uh, we often forget that. Uh, and that I think is important to say. However, when we look forward, I do believe there is a clear risk of, I would say, backlash um, if that pandemic uh, lasts longer than expected. Because when you look at uh, the scenario that the markets have been building in so far, uh, it is very much based on a very strong rebound um, in the second half of 2021. And when we look at uh, what we see today, the sanitary crisis still continuing, the delivery of vaccine uh, rather slow than fast, um, mutations coming up. And so the question is, um, how can the different uh, states and the central bank uh, accommodate uh, this uh, movement now with the necessary uh, economic policy and uh, uh, accommod uh, accommodating for longer, making sure that also uh, the financial discipline uh, of uh, the states uh, is really kept. Because um, I think one thing is absolutely critical for me, which is the confidence in the financial markets. Um, there is a lot of confidence now. We've seen that, uh, uh, as I said earlier, the um, uh, economic actors uh, have really managed the crisis very well. But um, there is also, I would say, no magic thinking. Um, when I hear... Uh, discussion coming up around uh, debt cancellation, um, uh, I would see that as a clear breach of trust of the markets. And for me, this would not be an option. Uh, when we look at uh, other uh, theories of uh, getting back to a much stronger aus austerity, this is probably also not on the table. So uh, finding the right balance now uh, of continuing to manage the crisis well, but not destroying confidence in the market is something extremely important um, and extremely relevant for the success of this next phase. And very quickly, how do you rate uh, regulators' performance during this crisis? You were critical of European regulators' approach to dividends, for example, during the pandemic. So very quickly, what, what, how do so, you think they I think regulators have managed this crisis very well because uh, the 2008 crisis has been a very important learning ground for the industry. And uh, we have certainly uh, significantly increased um, the capital levels, uh, increased the solvency, uh, increased the prudence. And uh, it has clearly shown that uh, the majority of uh, banks and insurers um, have uh, uh, survived and lived well in that crisis. So regulation does work. Where I do, uh, uh, where I did address my criticism was not uh, on regulators per se. Uh, on the contrary, I think uh, that has worked really well. But was on the question around dividend payments and its consistency across Europe. Um, if we live uh, in a common Europe uh, in which um, we should assume the same approach, the same regulatory approach, I would also then expect uh, a, a very consistent treatment um, across Europe when it comes to dividend payment. This has not been the case uh, in 2020, but I have very strong hopes that for 2021 there is consistency and more consistency than 2020 around this topic. Minister Jadan, Saudi Arabia's presidency of the G20 was uh, totally overtaken by the, by the COVID crisis. And the main focus was on how wealthier uh, nations could or should support the, world, the world's poorest nations. Um, there was a debt relief uh, initiative which enabled 73 of the world's poorest nations to suspend payments on bilateral loans. Um, did this deal go far enough? There has certainly been criticism that it hasn't, including from the World Bank. And there have been many calls for rich nations to allow the IMF to allocate more SDRs. Should more have been done? And was the Trump administration the barrier? Uh, thank you, Rola, and good morning. Good afternoon, uh, everyone, wherever you are. I think the, uh, 2020 has been uh, a very, very difficult year for everyone. And uh, Saudi is no exception. And during that time, we uh, obviously assumed the G20 presidency, but we're also we're dealing with two dual shocks of 
the pandemic and the uh, commodities prices. Uh, but when it comes to the G20 itself, I think while we actually continued with um, the uh, original mandate, uh, the agenda that we have put forward at the beginning or actually 2019, um, we had to adapt very quickly. Uh, and the G20 came together, uh, held two um, summits uh, in the same year. And I really, really believe that the G20 collectively uh, acted in a very cooperative way throughout um, uh, 2020. Uh, we started with um, uh, the financing gap and the, and the health, uh, international health arena, where uh, we cooperated with the EU and pledged north of 21 billion uh, US dollars to bridge the gap in terms of research and development of vaccines, therapeutics, and personal protective equipments. Uh, that was actually very, very uh, helpful. Uh, and then we looked at um, what should we do in the short term uh, and have very quickly, and for the first time, the G20 have done this, adopted the debt service suspension initiative. We extended this. Uh, initially, we agreed six months. We extended it to another six months, and then we agreed to extend it again, if needed, uh, on April uh, this year. Then we looked at the medium term and long term, and we started talking to the private sector, uh, looking at ways that we can work with them, not only the multilateral uh, and bilateral creditors, but also the private sector. And uh, if I was in the, the shoes of one of the 73 nations or even beyond, I would love to see uh, more action uh, from the wealthier nations. Uh, I, would like, I would like to see debt reduction. I would like to see the debt forgiveness. But also, at the same time, we need to make sure that we do not disrupt the uh, market. We do not impose our will as uh, sovereigns on the private creditors. Otherwise, we will harm these nations themselves. Because if we force them to uh, do any forgiveness, then they will not be actually made you know, making their uh, money available next time to these countries. So we need to be really trying to balance that act, which we did. We worked with them. We adopted the uh, new framework where basically we will look at each case, uh, each of these countries on a case-by-case -case basis in terms of debt restructuring. And also for the first time, the G20 agreed that they will look at debt relief at a sovereign level uh, and forgiveness on a case-by-case uh, basis, if that's the last option. So there has been actually quite a, you know, a lot of efforts within the G20. Been talking to our Italian uh, presidency for this year, and they are continuing on that same line. They are continuing on the action plan of the G20, which actually, for the first time, monitors everything that the G20 uh, committed to and what has been delivered. I am actually optimistic. Um, while I hear my colleagues talk about the uh, difficulties ahead, I think, yes, we are not out of the woods yet. But I really believe that 21 is going to be a more positive year than what a lot of people think. So, so, the, so the Trump administration was not a barrier to doing more? You will be surprised, actually, Rona. I mean, I am uh, Trump is behind us now, uh, but uh, you will be surprised that one of the most cooperative G20 uh, countries, when it came to these initiatives, supporting these initiatives, as actually convincing some of the difficult countries uh, who found some of these initiatives more difficult, actually, U.S. and Secretary Mnuchin was very helpful. And I have received actually a lot of support, not only from Secretary Mnuchin and the US administration, but also from Europe, from China. I think G20 uh, throughout G20 has been actually significantly cooperative. Let me ask you about the, the COVAX initiative and the G20 pledge to ensure cheap global access to, um, to the vaccines. That does not, uh, at this stage, seem to be going very well. And we know the risks of not vaccinating uh, the developing uh, world. What should be done here? Uh, Rola, I think, I think everybody realizes that if anyone is left behind, we are all at risk. So I think that is 
very clear in the minds of everybody, including the G20. We uh, supported the ACT Accelerator, including the COVAX uh, initiative, and that is continuing. I, actually, I was talking to them last week, uh, and there are actually plans to increase and accelerate uh, the vaccination um, distribution to, to the less fortunate countries. Saudi Arabia itself uh, is uh, thinking of a serious initiative uh, to provide significant more support uh, in actual vaccination. So we are negotiating with a lot of the uh, vaccination companies to provide more vaccination to particularly low-income countries uh, in this part of the world and Africa. I think there is, so this is a Saudi, around the world of Saudi Saudi available. A separate Saudi that is, that is right. That is absolutely right. In addition to COVAX, we are trying to see what can we do to some of the countries. Yemen, for example, some of the African nations that cannot afford it and will not be able to get enough from COVAX quickly, are trying to to uh, get them something uh, faster than that. Okay. Um, Governor, I'd like to um, uh, go back to you now and, and talk about uh, innovation. Um, central banks, I mean, the general view is that central banks have not really kept up with the innovation in the financial sector, whether it's fintech, stable coins, crypto, uh, but they are coming around to it. So let me ask you, what have been the benefits of China's fintech revolution? And um, how can the central bank at this stage ensure that tight regulation will not do more harm than good? Oh, thank you. Uh, I, I think uh, it is obvious to see that uh, uh, financial innovation, especially in the uh, fintech area, that uh, promote uh, financial uh, inclusive services, so that to make uh, the uh, financial services to a large number of people, uh, including small and medium enterprises, <laughs> low-income people and uh, lower the uh, transaction cost uh, uh, a lot and also reaching uh, far more uh, deep uh, in the markets that uh, they haven't been reached by the traditional uh, financial industry. So that, uh, that, that uh, benefit is uh, obvious, but at the same time, we, we can see also some uh, risks uh, uh, consumer information protection and also uh, some uh, monopoly uh, potential and, and also some misuse of the uh, monopoly power and so on and so forth. So that I, I think uh, uh, by and large, uh, People's Bank of China in the past uh, decade, uh, they have been consistently support financial in innovation, uh, especially in the fintech area, uh, mobile payment, services, uh, inclusive finance, uh, microloans, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, I, I think uh, the um, key point is that, uh, well, you have an environment that encourages financial innovation. At the same time, you see the uh, legal framework has to be very clear. For example, the ownership of the data and how to protect uh, consumer privacy, and also uh, how to safeguard the uh, abuse of uh, some uh, monopoly power. Uh, that, mm -hmm. that is uh, very important. And you know that uh, People's Bank of China recently, they have uh, uh, announced uh, the uh, regulation on the third party payment, regulation on the mobile payment, uh, and also to protect uh, consumers' data, uh, that regulation uh, in, in this uh, uh, regard. Uh, also, at the end, I have to mention the international cooperation. The discussion internationally, especially in Europe, the recent uh, two-act uh, uh, version of Market Act and also uh, the other uh, act uh, uh, discussed recently, yeah. Uh, have been circulating around the world, which uh, provide a uh, hint to us 
uh, that is uh, in order to uh, do the uh, innovation fintech because it's very easy to cross border so that uh, we'd better to have international cooperation and uh, jointly with Europe, with uh, US and other developing countries, jointly we can uh, getting closer to a common uh, consensus of, of the regulatory framework that would be a benefit to uh, everybody, uh, especially uh, far uh, benefit to the uh, low-income people by using the inclusive uh, finance. That's very interesting um, that you're looking at uh, the European acts. I wanted to ask you about and financial. Uh, um, it, it released, as you know, its prospectus in late August. It got the final approver, approval from the China Securities Regulatory Commission to list um, in October. So can you tell us why the IPO was, was stopped in November? And do you think that the Securities Regulatory Commission made a mistake in approving it? Uh, I think... Uh, uh... Uh, it's uh, uh, a complicated uh, uh, issue. Uh, I want to uh, mention that uh, first, uh, uh, everything uh, is uh, ruled by law, so that uh, we have to follow the legal uh, procedure. Uh, and uh, uh, they obviously, the uh, uh, security and IPO authority obviously uh, find some uh, uh, problem. And also mm -hmm. some relevant uh, agency uh, is uh, uh, investigating uh, the uh, suspect uh, uh, problems uh, re related to uh, monopoly. So, so that, uh, but you can see that every uh, procedure is uh, uh, according to uh, the legal framework. And also we emphasize uh, the protection of uh, property rights. And also we emphasize that uh, th this is a nonstop service to the financial market. You can see our, uh, the uh, mobile payment uh, provided by uh, Alipay uh, has been normal. And actually the uh, consumer's uh, feeling and the consumer's uh, uh, satisfaction in the process is entirely uh, satisfied. So, so that I think uh, uh, as long as we follow the uh, legal framework and everything according to the legal procedure and uh, also uh, have a, a general discussion of the society, uh, what is the uh, general consumer wants and what their problem, some of them complaining uh, they are privacy uh, being uh, violated and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say that this is a, a process and also uh, this pro once the uh, problem solved, it will go back to the uh, uh, track to uh, continue uh, consideration uh, according to law. And, and, and lead to an IPO, presumably. I, I would say that uh, the, you just follow the uh, standard of legal instruction, uh, you will uh, have the uh, result. Okay. Um, uh, Anna, um, fintech firms have grown massively in, in, in recent years, big competitors to banks. Uh, Jamie Dimon um, recently said that banks should be scared. I don't think I can say the word, but it's S H I. Dot, dot, dot. Uh, are you are you as scared as him? No, look, um, I would say the same thing uh, as I uh, say in general. Uh, uh, how I feel as, as a as a banker is that I'm optimist that that worries all the time. I think digitalization is a huge opportunity. It's the path to growth, to strengthen the financial system. Uh, it allows us to reach more people. Financial inclusion, you know, back to digitizing. In certain countries in 2020, including the UK, 80% of our sales have been through digital uh, channels. So 
all, all we need, and I think Jamie said this, I've said this many times, we need a level playing field. And I think the governor has alluded to that in three key areas. One is data, second is access to critical infrastructures, and third is innovation. So if you're asking banks to compete with a hand tied behind our backs, that's not fair. If banks are required, as we are in Europe, to share our payments data with other companies, as we are under PSD2, then others should be required to open their data because data is critical to being competitive in the digital economy. So we need to manage it in a way that is fair, open, and in the interest of citizens. And again, I'm referring to Europe, but the same could be said globally, especially if we want to avoid a future where we have two separate global economies. So again, um, we need to fix this. We need to fix this in an orderly way. We're not asked for any favors when we make these we want to be able to compete fairly. Uh, and as, again, has been referred to by the governor, the Digital Market Act and Data Act would go a long way towards solving these issues. We, of course, have comments, but we need to make these happen fast. And again, we need to do this in a way that is diverse, that supports the diversity, fair, competitive you know, economy that we have in Europe. Um, so. We need international cooperation, and we need to make this happen, uh, not just in Europe, but globally. And, you know, if this happens, I am confident we can compete. I'd like to bring uh, Minister Jadan and Thomas Ribeiro uh, to a um, uh, to answer a question from uh, Manuela Stefania Fulga. Um, no, sorry. The question is uh, from uh, Jürgen Richtering, first vice president of the BRD. And the question is, what are the limitations of the so-called magic money tree? Uh, Minister, would you like to take that one on? Uh, two things. Let me just comment um, uh, on the previous discussion, and I think sure. this is actually very interesting. I think uh, while I agree uh, totally um, uh, with the earlier comments, I, I think still uh, the conventional banks are underestimating the disruption that is coming from digital um, players. Uh, I'm not suggesting that uh, we should not provide level playing field. I think absolutely right. I think not only level playing field, but also we need to protect the depositors' money, and we need to make sure that these people have actually money that does not belong to them, so they need to be subject to the same regulatory framework. But still, I really believe that banks, if they are not careful, if they are not innovative enough and quick, they will be left behind. Uh, and this is not, I'm not talking in Europe, I'm talking in Saudi and beyond and the region. Uh, so um, people should not underestimate what is happening in the digital arena. Uh, and when it comes to generally, and I, I, I'll tell you in, in, in Saudi, uh, there will need to be a very delicate balance when it comes to um, what the monetary policy can do and can't do. Uh, while we are a big currency, to the US dollar and the central bank has limitations in terms of the interest rate, but they have also a lot of tools, as we have seen throughout 2020, to actually support the banking system <coughs> to um, uh, you know, relax some of the, the regulatory uh, requirements to ensure that the banks are, uh, and the financial system is, is stable and supportive of the economy. I really believe that what we are seeing now is that central banks are clearly playing a very clear role in, in terms of economic growth, in terms of supporting growth and su supporting markets. But we also need to be very careful. We need to make sure that we balance between not inflating the markets and not causing even more risks, but not also drawing, uh, or drawing the um, uh, stimulus packages uh, uh, prematurely. I think we. This is possibly the time when you need more stimulus package because now firms are thinking about, yes, things are looking positive. We need to invest, so we need to push them. But you need to be very, very careful and you need to balance what you are doing. Otherwise, you could risk more than what you are benefiting the economy. Uh, Thomas Biber, uh, what are the limitations of the magic monetary? 
think the key question here is uh, how do we make sure that uh, the, um, I, I use the words, uh, magic money tree um, uh, remains a, uh, uh, an exception uh, to manage a crisis and does not become uh, a normality um, uh, at, uh, to which we get used to uh, over the next uh, 10 years? Because uh, it clearly, um, if it w was to become a normality, uh, has questions around uh, the distortion uh, of our economy. Uh, lots of people uh, are talking about this famous word of uh, zombification. So um, that, uh, yes, the policy uh, is helping the market in general uh, to um, recover, to survive, uh, to deal well. But uh, we also do not want to um, uh, take away the natural uh, selection mechanism uh, of market that uh, favors the survival of uh, innovative companies um, and also correct um, mistakes. Uh, that companies have made. That, for me, is the first limitation. And the second one is clearly a longer-term one around uh, the role of banks. Uh, when you look um, central banks uh, uh, through uh, this uh, very, very um, large program of um, uh, monetary policy uh, are, in effect, uh, taking decisions um, on the allocation of credits uh, in the economy. Uh, which traditionally was always uh, the role of the banks. And I think um, this remaining an exception, an exception and not becoming normality uh, is very important also for the uh, functioning or for the good functioning of banks in the system. And this is combined with effective agents. What is the role of traditional banks versus uh, the central banks in the long term? So just two limitations um, that uh, I think are important to clarify uh, as uh, this uh, continues. Um, a good note on which uh, to end this panel, because um, we have to end it. We've, we have run out of time, exception rather than normality. But also I say this in the hope that we are going return to some form of normality uh, in the coming months. Thank you uh, to my panelists for a fascinating discussion, and thank you to the audience for listening to us. Have a great rest of the day.